So let's go ahead and let's open our Bibles up to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 12. We're going to continue our study today in Matthew. And we have a couple of interesting topics to look at this morning uh, as we move forward in our study. This is probably one of the longest chapters, I think, in Matthew, so we're going to be in chapter 12 for a couple weeks, but uh, this morning I wanted to try to cover a, a decent amount of it. You know how we are around here. Sometimes we don't get too far, but that's okay. But we are going to start at the beginning, chapter 12, and I want to read down through verse uh, 8 to get us started this morning. It says, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple, they profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place, there is one greater than the temple." But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would, have not, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. So what a great story we have here concerning the Sabbath. Seems kind of petty when you look at these two incidents, that we, we, these accusations that are being made here. And uh, pettiness really is contagious. Pettiness is something that really has flown down through the ages along with everything else. People tend to be very petty about things. And it's sometimes people kind of get a sense of their own self-importance or their own self-righteousness. And they want to impugn that upon you. They want to pile those things upon our shoulders. And really, it's a matter of being judgmental. It's a matter of being condemning. It's a matter of putting ourselves in God's place and judging others. And we know from our study in Matthew what the Lord says about judging each other. We don't, first of all, have the authority to do that. Only He does. And Jesus is going to make a very important point to us here this morning about this, this pettiness. So with what he's gone through already, what we've seen him going through already, do you think he was surprised or shocked that he was pulled aside because his disciples were eating a little bit of grain on the Sabbath? I don't think so. I seriously doubt it. But here's one of the things we're going to learn this morning, which is really powerful. Jesus knew the Word of God inside and out. Now, mind you, he did not have a New Testament back then. They had the law and the prophets. They had the books from Genesis all the way through the Old Testament. And we know that the Old Testament speaks of Christ. Everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. Now, a lot of people don't see that. But when you look at these things as a type or a shadow or something along those lines, you begin to learn very quickly that most, well, not most, all of the stories, the law, the prophets, all of those things were written to point to the Messiah. This is what Jesus had to work with. This is what the Lord was about to interpret for them, to give them a clear understanding of what's going on. Now, when it comes to the Sabbath, we're here today on Sunday, but did you know this isn't the Sabbath? I mean, in Jewish world, when is the Sabbath? 
It's Saturday. It's always Saturday. But Christians for 2,000 years have gathered on Sunday to come together for fellowship and church because Sunday is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. So we celebrate that together as believers. But in the Jewish culture, their Sabbath was on Saturday. Now, there are groups out there today that would confront you or me. They have already. I've gotten some nasty grams from folks out there that warn me that what we're doing is heresy because we're meeting on Sunday instead of Saturday. And on Saturday, when you're mowing your grass or going to the beach or when you're doing all the things you do on Saturday, you are sinning. Isn't that sad? That really bums me out, that people would become so condemning and petty and judgmental that they would attack others like that. One of the things that I don't like to do, and that's attack other people in churches. I don't like to do that. Because I believe as a pastor here, God's given me responsibility with you to teach you good things, true things. And what's going on in all these other places around the world or in our country, even in our community? I don't have time to get in those weeds. I don't want to get in those weeds. I figure if God's calling somebody to do something and they're going a certain direction, guess who they're going to have to stand before? They're going to have to stand before the Lord someday and give an account of what they have done and how they have ministered or not ministered to their people. If you've been around here very long, you know that we're not legalistic here. We don't stare at a gnat and swallow a camel, so to speak. We're very free. There's no real dress code. There's no begging for money. There's a lot of things that we do here that makes all of us together have a sense of freedom together, not intimidation. But those who are legalistic, those who are of the opinion that we shouldn't be meeting on Sunday, and many other groups also, are very, very legalistic. And one of the things you learn very quickly about these people is they do not understand grace. They don't understand that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. They think somehow by keeping the rules and stepping in line that they're going to get themselves into heaven. How many of you know that's not true? No matter how good you are in line, no matter how much you step to the tune, you're always going to come short. You're always going to misstep. We all do. Thank God for Jesus. Amen? Amen. So it's interesting that Matthew brings up this situation here before us this morning. Immediately after Jesus has made a comment in verse uh, chapter 11, and I want to read it to you in verse 28, chapter 11. It says, come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest in your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. To me, that's a life verse. To me, that's a beautiful refuge. To find myself coming to Jesus because I am heavy laden. I am burdened. I do have times of fear, maybe doubt, sickness, hardship. Maybe my relationship with him is maybe a little off kilter and I'm struggling with that. And he's not telling you and I this morning, go out and clean up your act. Go out and make it right and then come back to church. Then you can meet with me. He's not saying that there's a specific group of people that can come to him. This is another thing that we need to understand. There is no specific group. There are those out there that would say, we are the only true church. There are those out there that would say, if you don't join our group, then you're really not saved. Let me point something out to you here. In verse 28, he says, Come to me, all of you who belong to a certain denomination, and I'll give you rest. 
Come to me, all of you who have been baptized, and I'll give you rest. Come to me if you belong to a certain organization. I'll give you rest. It's not what we're reading here. Come to me, all of you. No matter where you're from, no matter what your background is, no matter where you've been, Jesus is calling out, come to me, all of you who labor. And that does not exclude anybody. We all fall into that category. You might ask, well, what's the Greek word for all? It's all. It means everybody. No limits. I love that about Jesus. He invites us. And when you're heavy laden and when you're burdened, we come to him and he wants to give us rest. Now, what is the meaning of the word Sabbath? It means rest. Remember in Genesis, when God finished creating all things, it says he rested on the seventh day, on the Sabbath. In the book of Hebrews... The writer of Hebrews tells us that the Sabbath, like so much Old Testament stuff, is a shadow of Jesus. It's a picture of Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. And that exactly is why G- the, the Ten Commandments say, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Because Jesus is our Sabbath. And when we come to him as our personal Lord and Savior, we enter in to his rest. We enter in to his Sabbath. So in a sense, it's kind of ironic here that he just got done saying this. And I just love the way he describes, it just draws us to him when he says, you know, I'm gentle. I'm lowly in heart, and my yoke is easy. My burden's light. Have you ever heard anybody use the term, the burden of the Lord? I've just been weighed down with the burden of the Lord. If you're weighed down with the burden of the Lord, I don't think that's the Lord. Not according to what I just read. My burden is light, he said. And our burden laying upon him causes us to feel light also. Now we can interpret that and we can say, well, the burden of the Lord, basically the the commitment that I'm under to serve God, isn't always easy. Well, that's true. But if I constantly find myself beat down, condemned, unhappy, Well, I think maybe I need to step back a little bit, maybe view things a little bit differently. One of the things the Bible tells us is that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Now, again, when you read that passage, you think, really? The joy of the Lord, that's it? Yeah, that's it. The joy of the Lord is our strength. I've heard that little acronym, I guess it is, where people say it's Jesus, others, and yourself. In that order, it spells out joy. Our lives are molded around that very truth. It's Jesus first, it's others second, and ourselves last. And we'll experience the joy of the Lord. But I think in our culture and in many of our worlds, it's exactly the opposite of that. It's me first. And if I have time, it might be others And if I have a lot of spare time, it might be him. And there are people who claim to be believers in Christ who live like that. And they don't have the joy of the Lord. When you read in Galatians the fruit of the Spirit, Paul tells us the fruit of the Spirit is love. And to describe what that love means, the first word he uses is joy. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, all of these things fall under the category of God's love, of the fruit of the Spirit. It's always important for you to be a fruit inspector, by the way. It helps you not to be judgmental. 
We're fruit inspectors. I want to look and see, is there good fruit coming from that? And I could say, yes, then that's of God. So Jesus is confronted here right after he has made this beautiful invitation to them. So here they are, Sunday morning, they're going to church. Here you are on a Sunday, or they were going on a Saturday on the Sabbath. You're coming in on Sunday morning, you're on your way to church, you're coming in from Mac maybe or somewhere else, and you swing by the coffee shop. And you grab yourself an espresso. And somebody from the church sees you there and they say, you're not supposed to drink coffee on the Sabbath. This is how petty this was. They're on their way. They're going through a field. They're hungry. He told them at the very beginning, if you want to follow me, you need to know foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. If you're going to sign up with me, he said, this is what you're signing up for. So don't expect to be going to the finest restaurants Staying in the finest hotels. Expect difficulty. And so here they are trying to get a little bite to eat out of the farmer's field. And they're confronted by the religious powers in the area. They come and they say, your disciples are sinning, basically. And so Jesus responds to them. It's very interesting when he responds to them. And of course, this charge, we know it's referring to the very strict Sabbath laws that the Jewish people have. You can't really do much of anything on the Sabbath according to the law. And why was that? Was it because God was just being mean and wanted to rob you of a good time? Or was it mean, does it mean that the Sabbath is holy and we should be, we should be, we should be thinking about the things that God has done for us on a day that we come together like this. It's all about Jesus. And, you know, they weren't even allowed to collect firewood on the Sabbath. You weren't allowed to carry any burden on the Sabbath. You weren't allowed to harvest anything on the Sabbath. But yet, in the temple, the priests in the temple were sacrificing animals to the Lord on the Sabbath. And that would be considered work to us common folk as far as the law is concerned. So that's why Jesus said in our text today, he said, hey, even your priests are violating the Sabbath in a sense. And what about David? We just read this story a few weeks ago on Wednesday night about how David went in looking for food from the priests. And all he had was this bread that was set aside. It was supposed to sit on the altar for seven days. It was an offering to the Lord. And then after seven days, the priests were allowed to consume it for themselves, to eat it. But here it is, sitting on the altar. It hasn't been seven days. David goes in and he's very hungry. And as he's fleeing from Saul, and the only food there was this bread. And even though it was contradictory to their ceremonial law, Human necessity overrode that. Human necessity was more important than ceremonial rules. The priest knew that. David knew that. Jesus knows that. We hear a lot about <clears throat> race today. It's a very divisive uh, Situation that we find ourselves in many times. But I'm going to tell you this morning, I know that God's involved in race too. He's involved in the human race. Okay? All of us. We are all important to Him. We are all important enough and valuable enough in His eyes that He would die for you, that He would lay down His life for you, for the human race. The Bible tells us that God said, I would rather have mercy than sacrifice. And really, the bottom line here is just use a little common sense. We're going to go harvest food after church down in the fellowship hall. Are we violating the law? Absolutely not. This is human necessity, things that we need. Well, these people are constantly looking for a reason to accuse the Lord. 
They're constantly looking for a reason to condemn him. And we've gone through these passages where he's healed these people. He's done all these miraculous things. He's calmed the sea. He's done so many things. And now they're feeling threatened by him. Now they want to silence him. And so they're looking for some way that they might take him out and have him arrested. Verse 7 tells us, if you would have known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless, speaking of the twelve that were with him. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. He is the Sabbath. He is the Creator. He is the one that rested on the seventh day. And he's declaring that to them right now in these very words that he is saying, he is the Lord of the Sabbath. There can only be one Lord of the Sabbath, and that has to be God and God alone. And automatically, they know what he's talking about. They understand what he's telling them, and they don't like it. Verse 9, so when he departed from there, he went into their synagogue. And behold... There was a man who had a withered hand, and they asked him, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, that they might accuse him? They're trying to trap him. They're trying to be sneaky here. And so Jesus answered them, and he says, what man is there among you who has one sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? How much more value, then, is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is good to, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Who's, who's talking here? The very person that wrote the Ten Commandments. The very person that wrote the law. The very person that created the universe. In the Sermon on the Mount, we read many, many times, you have heard it said, speaking of the law, And Jesus said, but I say unto you. His words have more authority than the law. He was the authority. He is the authority. And when he says things like this, it is therefore good. It's okay to do good on the Sabbath. It's okay. It's a good thing. And he uses an example that actually is... um, it's something that's given to, the, to them as a, a, a common sense thing when he says, say you're out in your field and you find a sheep in a ditch, you're going to leave it there to die because it's the Sabbath? No, there's a provision for you to be able to pull him out of the ditch, care for him, her, whatever it is. But isn't a human being much more important? Well, easy question, isn't it? Of course. It's a biblical answer. His first answer was a biblical answer, talking about David. He's talking about the prophets. He's talking about the law here. He's trying to explain it to them, and he knows the word inside and out. So he goes into the church, and uh, there's a guy in there that has a shriveled up hand, arm. I had a friend when I was growing up that had that kind of a thing. His arm was... Kind of stuck like that. Used to really feel sorry for him. And it seems like this man is much the same. His, it's withered up. It's kind of paralyzed, if you will. And he sees the man in there. And, and, and he's given this example of the sheep in the ditch. This man was in a ditch. This man was in his own little pit. This man was a cripple. And Jesus is seeing him and he's having compassion upon him. His attention is drawn to him, and they're just standing back waiting to see what he's going to do. So that's why he asked this question, is it okay to do good things on the Sabbath? Well, yeah, okay. And he says to the man, stretch out your hand, and he stretched it out, and it was restored as whole as the other. We didn't see any backflips. We didn't see any humming. We didn't hear any chanting. We didn't 
see a bunch of rigmarole and flopping all over the place. And No, Jesus said, stretch out your hand. Now, if I was the man, I'd probably be standing there going, stretch out my hand, are you nuts? Can't you see what's going on here? How do I stretch out my hand? But I think when the Lord said that to him, it was a response that the man had before he had time to even think about it. He's like, whoa, I just stretched out my hand. I'm healed. You know, that happened to Peter when they were going into the temple and there was a lame man laying out in front of the temple begging for money. And Peter walked up to him and he said, I don't have any silver or gold, but what I do have, I will give to you. So in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And it says that Peter reached down and grabbed the man by the the hand and pulled him up to his feet, and he was able to walk. Not only was he able to walk, he danced. He praised God. And everybody there knew he had been born like that. They were all amazed at what had happened. Now, today, there's a lot of talk about healing and all the things that happened. Does God heal today? Absolutely does. He's in the business, right? But there's some dynamics about that gift, about that event when it happens. If my brain gets in the way of something like that, it could probably quench it out very quickly. Like, how can I stretch my hand out? I'm paralyzed. Are you kidding me? But I'm not going to think about that. I'm just going to respond to what he said to me, and I'm going to find myself suddenly, I'm healed. No glowing light. They didn't take an offering. He just blessed this person and healed him. It was a step of faith. It was a moment of response by that man, by the lame man at the temple. It was a moment of response. He just grabbed him and pulled him up, and before he knew it, he was on his feet. He did it right in front of them on purpose. Verse 14, when the Pharisees, they went out and they plotted against him how they might destroy him. Are you kidding me? He has done everything to love people. He has done everything to let us know who he is. And they're threatened by it. They're afraid of him because he just might step on their power. He just might bring something new into their midst. And they don't want to lose their position. You see how illogical this is, that he's doing nothing but good, but now they're plotting to kill him because of that? You know, it hasn't changed much if you think about it. In many ways, it's the same way today. There are those who are plotting to silence you because of the good things that you do. They can't stand it. And they won't let you reason with them. All they want to do is silence you. And as illogical as this right here is in our study today, it's just as crazy today in the world we live in today. There are those who would plot to destroy us. The Lord, the Bible, the gospel, the hope that we have. It's too bad that mankind has such a wicked heart. So Jesus knew that they were going to try to destroy him, and so it says in verse 15 that he departed from there, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Yet he warned them not to make it known that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him. He will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, And a smoking flax he will not quench till he sends forth justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will trust. Wow, that's powerful. From the book of Isaiah. Now his disciples, the apostles, the common folk, they were hoping 
that this was the guy that was going to come in and have revolution in the streets. They were hoping this was the guy that was going to overthrow the oppressive government. That Israel might again, once again, become a great power and rule and reign. Didn't happen. Many times what we think might be God's plan is totally far-fetched from what God's plan really is. These people didn't understand God's plan. They didn't know the word. They didn't understand the Old Testament scriptures because if they did, they wouldn't have been looking for a revolutionary. They would have been looking for a man who fit this description. I just love it how it says, when he knew it, he withdrew. You know, many times in our lives, we get in a situation where it's fight or flight. And we have to make that choice. Did Jesus have the authority to make that choice? Well, absolutely. Could he have made the choice to fight? Absolutely. Could he have taken them all out with one fell swoop? Absolutely. But that wasn't his mission. That's not why he came. So he chose to back off. He chose to withdraw from there. And as he's withdrawing, the multitudes are going with him. I can see them all leaving the church and just following him out. And it says that he healed every single one of them of whatever they might have had. You know, one of the greatest diseases we have in our existence, it's terminal. And truly, there's no human cure for it. And we call it sin. It's the one disease that we will never be able to conquer. It's the one disease that will take out every human being because of it. But there is a cure. And you and I have that cure. Many times I go maybe to the jail or to the prison or to the mission or something like that, and I see these people in there, and they're just broken, and they're hurting. And I know that in my pocket I have the pill. I have the serum. I have the cure. And what kind of a person would I be knowing that they're all terminal? They're dying, and I have the cure, but I'm going to keep it in my pocket. I'm not sharing it with anyone. We have the same thing. We have that cure in our pocket. We have the blood of Christ. We have the forgiveness of sin in our pocket. We have a living hope that we carry with us in our pocket everywhere we go, and we can offer it to those who have no hope. We can bring it to those who need it the most. What a blessing that God has given us. So, you know, as we're looking at this, this whole text this morning, I want to take a second and look at this passage from Isaiah 42. This is the servant who God the Father chose. It's my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. And I will put my spirit upon him and he will declare justice to who? Well, the old King James says to the nations, to all the nations of the earth, to the Gentiles. That's us. It's not just for Israel, not just for the Jews, it's for all of us. And I love this in verse 19. He's not going to quarrel. He's not going to argue. He's not going to stand in the streets and cry out in the middle of the streets because no one will listen to him. And a bruised reed he will not break. What is a bruised reed? What's he talking about? Well, you know, along the rivers there, this grass would grow and it was like a reed and, you know, would, like the cattails or some kind of a grass that would grow along the, the, the shoreline there. And when the wind would blow, depending on which direction the wind blows, the grass would bend that direction. Kind of like human beings, you know. We bend whatever direction the wind seems to be blowing at the time. James uses an example of the waves of the sea. He said a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. He's like a wave in the sea that's just driven and tossed by the wind. No real direction. Just whatever happens, happens. 
And Jesus is saying, sometimes those reeds, sometimes that tall grass, as it's bending, it will break. It will crack over and it will be bruised right there where it bends. And so he's telling the people right here, he says, if you're like that, if you've been bent over and bruised by the things of the world, I'm not going to go in there and break it the rest of the way. I'm here to heal it. I'm here to give it stability. A smoking flax, a little bit of a wick. You know, I was in the Boy Scouts growing up. And one of the things we used to have to do when we'd go on these little campouts and stuff, we'd have to build a fire. So you're out there, and you know, the wind's blowing, and you're trying to make this little fire, and you got your little pile of kindling there, and you're a match, and you're, you know, you see a little spark. Well, you don't get up and stomp it out. You blow on it. You fan it so that it becomes a flame. And this is what the Lord is speaking of right here. He says the same thing. You might be just hanging on with a flicker today. You might be barely making it today. But I'm going to fan that flame. I'm not going to snuff it out. And it's going to become a huge flame. And it's going to bring warmth and light to those who are around it. In Luke 24, Jesus said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And then, beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning him. From Moses to the prophets, he was able to do a Bible study with these guys and show them he is in the Old Testament. This is who the Old Testament was talking about. He taught them. I love that about Jesus. He was a teacher of the word. And he was able to pull the word together and use just the exact things that we need to hear. He's not going to quarrel. He's not going to force himself on us. He's not a political activist or a warrior leading a revolution. You know, when John the Baptist was doing his ministry in Matthew 11, Jesus began to talk about John. And he asked them a question. He said, what did you go out in the desert to see? Did you go out to see a reed, the grass, if you will, swayed by the wind? John wasn't a piece of grass swayed by the wind. John was strong. He was immovable. He wasn't blowing all over the place and fickle and allowing his feelings to direct his world. He walked by faith just as we're asked to do also. He was a strong tree, if you will. This bruised reed, it speaks of oppressed, broken, downtrodden people. And his attitude towards them is, I won't take advantage of you. I know you're down. I'm not going to step on you while you're down. I'm not going to abuse you. I'm not going to be harsh to you. I'm going to show you my love. I'm going to show you my ultimate love and forgive you of your sins. I've heard it said by people in years past that the Christians, the church, is the only ones that kill their wounded. That's terrible. But I've heard that said many times, that we're the ones that kill the wounded. Somebody gets weak in our midst, and we want to trample them. We want to throw them out. We want to get rid of them because they're not meeting up to their expectations. Jesus calls us as the body of Christ to be a healing factor, amen? He calls us to be people who care about those who are a broken reed or their wick is just barely flickering. That's why we're here this morning. You know, Paul wrote a letter to Timothy, who was a young pastor, and he said to Timothy, This is your job as a pastor, Timothy, to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Listen to that for a second. A pastor's job is to equip you 
to do the work of the ministry. Because when you're equipped, you're armed and dangerous with love. When you're equipped, you have a light that shines in a dark place. When you're equipped, you're equipped because of God's word. Knowing his word. That's why there's such an emphasis placed on this here. To teach you the word of God. To equip you to do the work of the saints. Whatever that may be. Whatever God has called you to do. I love that. Some people say, well, it's the pastor's job. He should be out there knocking on doors. He should be standing in the streets preaching and all that kind of stuff. That's not what Paul told Timothy. You get them ready and send them out and let them do the work of the ministry. You minister to them, they'll minister to others. That's the, that's the plan. So you and I, we realize this morning that, yes, we are forgiven of our sin. Why don't you guys come on up, worship team, come on up. We are forgiven of our sins, but you know what? We also realize at the same time that one thing that God will not overlook is injustice. He can't. He cannot just overlook sin. Sin has to be dealt with. And when it comes to my sin that would lead to eternal death and condemnation, Jesus dealt with that on the cross. But when it comes to my sin that might have a direct effect on my life or my loved one's life or people around me's life, I'm going to be held accountable for that stuff. You are too. And the Lord is just reminding us. And you got to remember this in 2 Peter. Peter says, God is not slack when it comes to his promises, as some men would count slackness, but he's long-suffering towards us. And he's not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is what we get to do. We get to bring that news to a world who truly has no hope. And believe me, just because we're Christians doesn't mean that God's overlooked our sin. The ultimate price was paid for our sin. And it was his life on the cross. And it hasn't changed in 2,000 years. Sin is still destructive. Sin is still death in the end. And you and I, we will give an account to Jesus. But it won't be at the great white throne. It won't be on that day that everybody's afraid of. It'll be on a day before you'll stand before Christ. Let me just finish with this passage in 2 Corinthians. It says we must all stand before Christ to be judged and to have our lives laid bare before him. Each of us will receive whatever he deserves for the good or the bad things he has done in this earthly body. And when someone becomes a Christian, he becomes a brand new person inside. He's not the same anymore. A new life has begun. All these new things are from God who brought us back to himself through what Christ Jesus did. And God has given us the privilege of urging everyone to come into his favor and to be reconciled to him. For God was in Christ, restoring the world to himself, no longer counting men's sin against them, but blotting them out. This is the wonderful message that he has given us to tell others. We are Christ's ambassadors God is using us to speak to you. We beg you as though Christ himself were here pleading with you to receive the love that he offers you, to be reconciled to God. For God took the sinless Christ and poured into him our sin. And then in exchange, he poured God's goodness into us. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 through 21. That's beautiful, isn't it? Isn't it nice to be reminded of the basic, basic stuff? To be right back to the cross once again. He died. He took the penalty for your sin and mine. Maybe this morning, maybe you're a little bit weighed down. Maybe in struggling with sin. Maybe you're feeling like maybe you're losing the battle. Maybe you've never engaged in the battle. Maybe you need prayer. Prayer changes things, you guys. 
If you need prayer this morning, I want to encourage you, before you go home, before you leave this room, go over and meet with Lonnie and Chris. They want to pray with you. They want to help you lay that burden down at his feet. Even while we're singing these last two songs, feel free to get up, and if you need it, go get it. Remember Jesus' words, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Amen? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word today. I want to thank you, Lord, that we can place all of our trust in these words, in the things that you've taught us, and we thank you so much for your love. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us a brand new beginning. A new life has begun because of you. You've reconciled us back to God. Oh, Lord, you've done for us what we could never do for ourselves. And so we worship you today. We thank you for what you've done on our behalf. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.